We need an inspector in here. I want to welcome all of you to the services of Grace Church at Franklin here in Franklin, Tennessee. We are located at 4052 Arno Road in Franklin, Tennessee. And if you are in the Nashville, Tennessee area, we'd love for you to come out and worship with us. We have Bible classes at 10 o'clock. We have Bible study on Tuesday evenings at 645. And we meet here on Sunday morning at 1045. Be glad to have you come and worship with us. If you can't make it, you can view our services on YouTube, Ustream, and Sermon Audio Video. That's what I'm supposed to do, so it's not, not anything wrong with having a little course of forgetfulness. This is called, Oh, Worship the King. Everybody knows that one, and I know that Sue knows it. Number one. Slow it down a little bit. Ready? Oh, worship the King all glorious above and great Just before the end of the year, I spoke to you regarding the return of the Messiah, and I'm going to pick that up again today. I don't have a certain number of studies in mind, but I am burdened about this particular thing in light of the events, world events. Would you stand together once more for the reading of Scripture? And uh, this is in 2 Peter, the New Testament. 2 Peter, chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3. I'm going to teach for... 30 minutes or so, and uh, wherever I finish, I'll take it up again, God willing. I want to remind all of you that we do have Bible study on Tuesday evening at 6.45. We try to end that study promptly at uh, 6.30, and we'd be happy to have you come out and study with us. Second Peter chapter 3. Peter says, the second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both whence I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, 
and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus. I want you to remember what the prophets said, and I want you to remember what we as apostles have said. Knowing this first, verse 3, there shall come in the last days. Now, I've told you many times that the last days began with the coming of Christ. You find that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Peter is the one that tells us what's a thousand years to God. He says a thousand years is like one day. One day is like a thousand years. God does not dwell in time. And we're not on our time schedule. Many generations have come and gone, but we're on his time schedule. So he says, knowing this first, there was a come in the last days, and they've been here. Scoffers. Walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Nothing has changed. For this they are willingly ignorant, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. In other words, God created the heavens by his word. And the earth standing out of the water and into the water. That says God made things come out of the water. And then he turned around in verse 6 and destroyed the world with water. Whereby the world that then was was overflowed with water and perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by that same word. Same word that created the heavens and the earth. That same word is preserving the heavens and the earth. Kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not be ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements, that is, everything that we see, rocks and mountains and hills, shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things are going to be dissolved. Did you understand what manner of persons you ought to be in all holy manner of life and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That has a question mark there. So all of that is a long question. He says... Since you know this, what kind of people, what kind of lives should you be living? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Father, we thank you for your word. We call upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you to help us as we consider these things. We ask it in his name for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. I have asked some of you about uh, helping with children's church. We're going to try to begin that. If people come here uh, to worship at 1045, then children from about 4 up to about 11, we'd like to see them be having their own church. And that for two reasons. 
One reason is because much of what I teach and preach in here, they will not understand. Now, let me say this to all of you, and I've said this many times over the years. And let me say it again. The most biblical way for your children to learn about God, about Christ, the Bible, is for you to teach them. And the way you do that is you take notes in here when I'm teaching or somebody else is teaching. And when you get home, you have a time. It doesn't have to be right after church. It can be that afternoon. It can be that evening. You sit down with your kids and you say, now, did you understand what Brother Sasser said? Did you hear what he, what he said? What was he talking about? Open up that passage over there to Second Peter and see if you can help them understand what I've tried to convey to them. That's the most biblical way, because you know this thing of classes and Sunday schools and all that, that's only been around for about 100 to 250 years. And the church, uh, the classes, we can't spiritualize your kids in 30, 45 minutes when the schools and everything else have, have them for five or six days a week. It's your responsibility, Mom and Dad, and you need to take that Seriously, my job as your pastor, your brother in the Lord, my calling is to feed the flock. But it is also to warn you. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, when he met for the last time with the elders of the church of Ephesus, he said to them, I have not ceased to warn you day and night about false teachers that are going to be coming. Peter talked about the false teachers here. So I'm going to give you in this study and maybe the next study some warnings. And I hope these warnings will cause us to take even more seriously our professions of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and our children's and our families. In Isaiah chapter 56, now I've asked them if they could put this on the screen. We'll see. If it's not, I'll tell you what's there. <laughs> but in Isaiah chapter 56, Isaiah talks about, in verses 10, 11, and 12, if you want to turn over there, you can do that. Isaiah chapter 56, he talks about preachers, teachers, prophets, so-called holy people and holy men, he talks about, he calls them dogs that don't bark. Look up there on the board. Dogs that don't, now the one thing, a lot of you probably use dogs as a security system in your home. Anybody gets in your yard or anybody, that dog senses that and starts barking. We had a dog that could tell us a couple of hours before a storm came. Uh, that, that, that dog was never wrong. We, she let us know uh, when a storm was coming. Always right. Dogs, one thing dogs do, they bark. And what I'm going to do this morning is do a little barking. Because I don't want to be a dog that doesn't bark. You remember there was a woman that came to the Lord Jesus asking him to have mercy on her daughter. And he said, he gave her a bunch of tough things. He said to her, it's not right to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. So she was a Gentile. And she said, that's true, Lord. But she said, even the little, the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. He throws some bread to the children and some of it falls on the ground. And she said, I'm just asking you for some crumbs. Isaiah says, these watchmen that will not bark, he says they are blind. Notice that. He says they are ignorant. His watchmen are blind. They're all ignorant. He says they're dumb. That doesn't mean their IQ is low. That's an old way of saying they don't say anything. They don't bark. When you're deaf and dumb, 
You're deaf, you can't hear, you're dumb, you can't speak. So he said, these watchmen are blind, they're ignorant, they're dumb, they don't speak, they don't warn you, they don't teach you, they cannot bark. He says they're asleep. He says they are greedy. Let's look at the next verse, Brother Joe. They are greedy, and they can never have enough. And there are shepherds that cannot understand, and they all look to their own way, and everyone for his own gain from his quarter. This is the generation. Now, I want to make something clear to you. I don't think there's anything wrong with a preacher, pastor, whatever you want to call them, elder. I don't think there's anything wrong with them having money, but I think it's wrong to just make all your money off the ministry. If you want to invest in things, I've invested in things. The Lord has prospered us and our family, and the Lord has blessed out just about everything we've ever invested in. And I don't mind telling you that. I've told you my little story. When I came here, I got $50 a week. <laughs> and I got two jobs, and I worked two jobs for a while before the Lord freed me up to go preach in a Bible conference in Kentucky. And when I went up there to speak in that Bible conference, there were other pastors there, and they asked me if I'd come and speak in their church, and that's how I started traveling. And I traveled. I'd come here and preach on Sunday and Wednesday, and I'd be traveling all over the United States. Did that for over 30 years. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but this is the first generation that I've seen where you've got multimillionaires that are in the ministry. And there's something wrong with that. And, and, and uh, Isaiah talks about these, these fellows that are greedy, never have enough. They look to their own way. They're about their own gain. Now look at the next verse, verse 12. And they are living it up. Come, they say, and I will get some wine and we'll fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow will be just like this day. Only we'll have even more then, much more abundant. I'm afraid our generation has become like the people who often heard a little boy crying, wolf, 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 when there was no wolf. We've heard that Jesus is coming for so long and so often that we've become insensitive to it. I still have the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come in 1988. I've got several books. Back in the late 1800s, a fellow named William Miller came up with a date. People sold all their belongings, got on the tops of their houses waiting for Jesus to come. The sun came up, the sun went down, and he said, oh, I miscalculated. He went back, recalculated another date. What all of these date setters have done is they have hurt the cause of Christ. The Bible clearly says no man knows the day or the hour. But that should also tell us, as Peter has said, if you want to turn back over there to 2 Peter, because we're going to be looking at those passages, some of these verses this morning. That should also tell us that we should always be ready not only because we don't know when he's coming for the world, but we don't know when he's coming for us. We're going through this world one heartbeat at a time. And I hear every day of people who did not expect to leave and they left. That's one appointment but we're going to keep. It is appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment Hebrews 9 and verse 27. So I want to reiterate for a number of reasons in the next few studies why I want to encourage you to be ready. In these United States, we have enjoyed blessings for so long that we just don't think that we can ever have anything that's going on over there in the Ukraine or over in Israel, or over in other parts of the world. We just don't think it can happen here. But I'm telling you, 
You're going to wake up one morning and the sirens are going to be blaring. And people are going to be running crazy. And the banks are going to be closed. And the stock market is going to crash. And you ain't going to have nothing. And if you don't have Christ, you won't have anything at all. Listen to this. He says that many, Peter says, many have become skeptical and vain regarding the second coming of Christ. So many false prophets, and not just false prophets, theological false prophets, there are other kinds of false prophets that I hope to expose you to in these studies. So many false prophets have sounded the alarm so often that many, many of them who used to be believers have become scoffers. And that's why he says this, he tells us this, there will be in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Verse 3 and verse 4 of Second Peter chapter 3. Where is the promise of his coming? That's all we've heard. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Our grandparents heard it. Great grandparents heard it. And it's been going been over 2,000 years now. Let me read it to you from the English translation. You must understand that in the last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lust. They will make fun of you. And they will ask, he promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our fathers have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. Turn back to chapter 2. Chapter 2. Verse 1. There were false prophets among the people as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately will bring in damnable heresies, a heresy is a false teaching, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness they shall with hypocritical words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not in their damnation, slumbers not. Let me open that up for you. He says they're going to be false teachers, and they're going to introduce false teachers false teachings and heresies in the church. And he says these false teachers in terms of numbers are going to be very successful because many shall follow their pernicious, is what the King James Version used. That's a word that means they're deadly, they're fatal, they're harmful ways. Many will follow them. They'll be very successful. And their doctrine will lead many who have professed faith in Jesus as the Christ to deny their faith. And they will either deny the Lord outright by abandoning, abandoning in any pretense of believing in him any longer. Or while yet professing to be Christians. Oh, I'm a Christian. They'll deny his power and his lordship over them by lawless and worldly lifestyle. My brothers and sisters, I know that any Christian can fall. The prodigal son is a good example, but I want to point out to you about the prodigal son. He didn't stay in the hog pen. He went back home. He returned home. I've, I've talked from that many, many, many times, and I know he was the father's son, but Jesus was careful to point out that that boy came to himself. He didn't just keep wallowing with the, with, the, with the hogs down there. He came to himself and he came back home. So these, they're going to be people who are going to deny the Lord by their lives while professing with their mouth, oh yeah, I'm a believer in Jesus. 
I mean, my friends, if there aren't false believers, if, if people can't say, I believe in Jesus and be a false believer, why in the world does the, world, did the Word of God warn us about false believers? Why does Jesus say in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? The motive for these false teachers, verse 3, will be wealth and power. And they will obtain that from their followers who will be sending them money. I have said this many, many times. I want to go on record again today. (laughs) I do not believe that we ought to sell the gospel. I don't believe we ought to write books and preach messages and tell people you can have it for $25 or more or for a gift of any size. I do not believe in that. I believe if God's in it, he'll support that ministry. If he's in it, he'll move on the hearts of people and they'll support that ministry. We're not selling Jesus Christ to the cheapest bidder. We're not trying to get people. Won't somebody please believe in Jesus? I have confidence in the power of the Spirit of God that He will deal with the hearts of people. He will bring sinners to the end of themselves. He will bring them to Christ. And if He doesn't do it, you just got a preacher that's converting people. You got, you got converted, you got mama called and papa called, and you got, you got somebody like, the, like Mr. Spurgeon. A man came up to him. One day, Spurgeon was walking down the street, and there was a man, he was inebriated. Boys and girls, that means he was drunk. He was intoxicated. And he said, hello there, Mr. Spurgeon. And Brother Spurgeon said, do you know me, sir? He said, yes, sir, I'm one of your converts. He said, Mr. Spurgeon said, you must be one of my converts. You're certainly not one of the Lord's converts. Oh, I can win them to Jesus, but only God Almighty can convert a sinner. You can take my word on that. Only God can convert a soul of a sinner. He says here, In verse 3, that in their greed, these false teachers will exploit you. And he says, you know, it may look like they are going to escape judgment, verse 3, but they will not. He says, when the time is right, it will come. Let me read it to you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation does not slumber. Here's the way the English translation translates it. For a long time now their judge has been ready and their destroyer has been wide awake. Now you'll take note from chapter 2 verse 9 that the Lord knows how to rescue his children from their trials and at the same time reserve the wicked for the day of judgment. Let's look at this. Chapter 2 of Peter. Now, he says, in verse 3, he says, through covetousness, they will with feign hypocritical words, make hypocritical words, make merchandise of you. Then down in verse 9, he says, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, that's trials and trouble, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. He says the Lord knows how to deal with the world in such a way that his people are spared and the wicked are judged. And he tells us, if you go back to verse 4, he says, The Lord brought swift judgment upon the angels that sinned. That's verse 4. Those angels that sinned, that's the angels that followed Lucifer in rebellion against God when Lucifer became the devil. 
The scripture teaches that he drew a third of the angelic host with him in rebellion against God. And then he says in verse 5, just as the Lord brought judgment on Noah's generation, but saved Noah, the eighth person, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And then he says, just as the Lord judged the Sodomites of Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 6, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that afterwards should live godly. Now, I said earlier to, today about children's church, and one of the, I never told you the second reason that I wanted to have it. The second reason is, let me illustrate this. Years ago, Lynn's mother lived with us for 13, 14 years. And while she was with us, she was converted. And I baptized her. She had a fear of water. But she submitted to baptism to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we would read the Bible at home, we'd read some of these passages that I'm going to mention to you. <laughs> she would say, you know, the Bible is an X-rated book. <laughs> and I said, yes, it is. You see, the King James people, they toned down lots of things, but there are things they couldn't tone down. And I'm going to expose you to some of those things, and hopefully the younger children won't know what these words mean. That's another reason why I don't want to embarrass anybody. But my friends, we have got to deal with reality. So he says, the Lord brought judgment on the angels of sin, verse 4, on Noah's generation, verse 5, on the Sodomites of Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 6. And he says, therefore, you can know that he's going to judge these false professors and these false teachers. And he tells us that in the last days, there will be bold attempts to deny the very existence of of metaphysical authority. You know what metaphysical is? That's something that's above the physical. In other words, it's the spiritual. The very existence of a God will be denied, much less the God of the Bible. The popular doctrine will be that there's no higher authority than man. And of course, that means this. Since there's no God, there's no such thing as divine authority. With the denial of a creator, God, there must of necessity be the denial of any ultimate authority whatsoever. You see, if there's no personal transcendent God, no God that's above everything, transcendent, above everything, if there's no personal in other words, I'm not saying, see, the force of Star Wars, that's not a person. That's a force. If there's no personal, transcendent God, then there is no authority over creation, much less over man. And so with God and his authority gone, it will be taught, it will be believed, and it will be embraced by the masses that the highest authority in the earth is man. And once this idea is received into the minds and consciousnesses of men, starting out with the universities and then work their way down to grade school, once this becomes the mindset of men and women, all fear of blaspheming, ridiculing, or speaking indignantly of the divine personhood of God will be gone. Men will no longer fear to speak about evil about God or curse God. Once the consciousness of a personal God and ultimate authority is gone, the hatred and the resistance to any and all authority among men will begin to manifest itself. You know, the devil promised Eve in the Garden of Eden that once she stopped believing and listening to her father and creator, once she stopped listening to him and believing him, 
she would be her own authority. She would have the freedom to follow her own desires and to determine for herself what is good and what is evil. Maybe it's not good for you, but it is for me. So in our generation, we develop what's called, for lack of a better term, situation ethics. Nothing's wrong all the time. It just depends on the situation. You might think it's wrong, but I don't think it's wrong. I might think it's wrong, but you don't think it's wrong. It's a situation. No longer do we go to the Word of God to find out what's right and wrong. You know why we're now seeing such conduct in our nation? Loss of respect begins with loss of respect for God. And then it works down, it means loss of respect for anything or anyone. Once the children of Adam and Eve, that's you and me, no longer respect the Creator, they will no longer respect any other creature, including themselves. They will lose self-respect. Why do so many people, both young and old, talk as they do? Dress as they do. Treat others as they do. They have lost all respect, including self-respect. And many of the young people are merely imitating and emulating their parents. And many of the young people and their parents are imitating and emulating the stars of Hollywood and television. You see, losing respect for the Lord means losing respect for all figures of authority. You know these shows that come on, I hadn't seen one in years, but most of you probably have seen one. These, these shows that come on where you supposedly have a judge, you know, and somebody comes on and the judge hears their case and they end up hollering at the judge and the judge ends up hollering at them. That shouldn't be allowed on television. That creates disrespect for authority. Shouldn't be allowed. But in the interest of money and fame, we have these kinds of programs on television. Notice chapter 2 of Peter, verse 10. He says, The Lord especially knows how to judge chiefly those that walk after the flesh, in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. They despise government. That's God's government there. See, all government, all authority in this world is delegated authority. Parents have delegated authority, authority that God gave them. Judges have delegated authority. Mayors and governors and presidents, they have delegated authority. They will give an account to God about the authority given to them. It's delegated authority. The original authority is God. And when we resist that authority, we're resisting Him. And He says here that once this attitude gains the ascendancy, in other words, once people begin to think like this, once this becomes a popular mindset, then people will openly and unashamedly walk it's King James Version. Walk means live, openly live, after their filthy bodily lust and flagrantly they will despise government. That is, they will despise God's government. They will despise God's authority. They will not be afraid to slander dignities, those who occupy high positions of authority. You know what the Bible commands us, Exodus 22, 28? You shall not revile the judges and the magistrates, nor curse a ruler of your people. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20, do not curse, do not speak evil of the king, not even in your thoughts. Again, it is God himself who has established government. And to curse and to despise and to resist those who are carrying out the law is to curse the God who gave us that law. Now, I know that there are bad governments. I know that there are unjust people in, in 
power. I know that. But human beings can't have any civility. We can't have a civil government of any kind without law. And the opposite of law and order is chaos and revolution. Now, have you noticed recently, in recent years, how so-called comedians increasingly make fun of those in positions of authority? Even the President of the United States is fair game. Can you imagine someone in Russia poking fun at Mr. Putin? Can you imagine the fate of one who ridiculed the Supreme Leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un? Or the President of China, President Xi? I tell you what, China might be communist. They don't have no revolutions over there. They don't have people breaking into stores and stealing stuff, do they? They don't have that because they're fearful of the law, even though that's a communist law. Here's the biblical truth. Get this. Hating the very thought of a God who rules the earth leads to hardness of heart. And that's what's happening to our population. Pharaoh is an example. Every time he refused to obey the Lord in the mouth of Moses to let the people of Israel go, the Bible says his heart was hardened. And hardness of heart eventually leads to a total void of the fear of God. And then having no fear of God, men will not be afraid to hate, ridicule, and persecute all who do fear the Lord and who do name the name of Christ. And listen, all the while this is going to be going on, Peter says, the topic of the day will be freedom. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. From whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. The goal will be absolute freedom. You know what absolute freedom is? That's the liberty to do as you please without any restraint or fear of punishment. Women will be liberated from the authority and the bondage so-called of the man. They will be liberated from the domestication of children and liberated from the home. Children will be liberated from the authority and bondage of their parents. Have you noticed how far the pendulum of authority has gravitated toward the so-called freedom of children in recent years, toward giving children liberty to do as they please without regard to their parents? This year, in 2024, depending upon the state one lives in, children may obtain drugs, get an abortion, transgender toward a sexual preference, and much more, all without their parents' approval, permission, or even knowledge. And if their parents try to interfere, their parents can be prosecuted. I got news for you. Got your seatbelts on? It's going to get a lot worse than that. Let me tell you where this is found, and I'll read it to you. It's found in Matthew chapter 10, verses 21 and 22. Listen to this now. Jesus said... Brother shall deliver up brother to death and father the child and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. There's going to come a time when Children are going to bear witness against their parents and cause their parents to be executed. How about that? Jesus said so. If he said so, it's going to happen. Today we are increasingly being told that young people should not have to report to their parents as to their whereabouts or their activities. In the event that a young woman discovers she's with child, she should not be required to tell her parents about it, even if she decides to get an abortion. After all, she should have the freedom to do so. Men should be freed from the bondage of marriage, the bondage of fidelity, 
the bondage of responsibility. In fact, the institution of marriage ought to be dissolved altogether. That's why people aren't getting married today. They're just living together and having kids. And these Hollywood couples are leading the way. They have headlines in classes, so and so and so. They look for their third child. They've never even been married. What's the use of marriage if couples can enjoy all the benefits of marriage without getting married? It's kind of like asking, what's the advantage of being a citizen of the United States? If people who come over here illegally have all the rights that citizens have, what rights, what's the big deal about being a citizen? Let's talk about something that's difficult to talk about, sexual freedom. There should be this freedom that we're wanting now today in America. There should be sexual freedom, freedom from the old the old Neanderthalian ideas of one partner per lifetime should be freedom from the biblical teaching that marriage can only be called marriage if it's between a man and a woman, a union of the opposite sexes. Today, homosexual marriages are in vogue. The marriages of Elton John, Jodie Foster, Ellen DeGeneres, Melissa Etheridge, Pete Buttigieg, you know who he is? He's President Biden's Secretary of Transportation. Jim Neighbors, known to most of us as Goma Powell. And many others. Not only are those kinds of lifestyles and marriages so-called acknowledged, but they are celebrated. As Albert Mola president of the Southern Seminary in Louisville famously said, listen to this quote, he said, today we condemn what the Bible celebrates and we celebrate what the Bible condemns. And those who will not join in the celebration must be condemned. Dr. Mola writes this and I quote, what makes the current moral and sexual revolution so different from previous moral revolutions is that it is taking place at an utterly unprecedented velocity. Previous generations experienced moral revolutions over decades, even centuries. The current revolution is happening at warp speed. Do you read the newspaper, or maybe do you watch the news, or do you get it on your computer? Do you aware that the Pope, just a few months ago, approved blessings for same-sex couples? More and more so-called Protestants, those that aren't Catholic, Christian domination, are sanctioning same-sex marriage, and even ordaining homosexuals to lead the local church as pastors and bishops and deacons. What does this sort of freedom mean? Okay, let me ask you this question. How do we determine the will of God? Man, I've read hundreds of books and knowing the will of God. Let me tell you something. You don't have to buy any book. This is the will of God right here. This is it. You don't have to go out and spend your money and somebody telling you how, can, how you can know the will of God. The will of God is in the Word of God. We can determine the will of God and we can either submit to it or we can do it our own way. To deliberately live your life, govern your family, run the government of a nation my own way is to desire to be free from the will of God. The freedom, my dear friends, that is being sought today by multitudes is freedom from God. We can get free from everything else, but we can't get free from Him. Freedom from God means cruel and inhuman bondage. You know what I mean by that? Look again at that 19th verse, 19th verse of chapter 2. While they promised him freedom, they themselves are slaves of depravity, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. There is an inexorable 
Something that's inexorable is true always at all times, and an absolute law in this world, a law as certain as the law of gravity. The law of gravity teaches us that what goes up must come down. And the law of freedom from God, the law of I don't want God's will, I don't want God to rule over me, that law teaches us that whoever is free from God is destined to go down. Down in this world and down in the world to come. To be free from God and His authority is to be under the authority of whatever one gives oneself up to. The freedom God gives us through faith in Christ is free freedom from the dominion of sin, of self, of Satan, and the spirit of the world. And the door to this freedom is truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The door to this freedom is truth. The foundation of this truth is the Word of God. And the conduit, the channel by which the Word sets us free is faith. We read in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said to the Jews which believed on him, those who said they had faith in him, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples indeed, not just disciples in word only, but you're really my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, everybody in this world is free, and everybody is a slave. If Christ is my master, I am free from the world. If the world is my master, I am free from Christ. It is not possible to be free from the world and free from Christ at the same time. Let me see if I can wind this down for today. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse, first two verses. He tells us that he's writing to cause us, to cause his readers to remember the past history of the rebellious. That in every case, the Lord brought terrible judgment upon all those who rebelled against him. And he tells us that he hopes the remembrance of these things will stir us up to determine that no matter how bad things are, we will continue trusting in and walking with the Lord. He reminds us to remember that the prophets predicted all these things would happen before the coming of the Lord. That's verses 3 and 4 of chapter 3. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, our Savior reminded His disciples that these things would signal the beginning of the end, the beginning of the vengeance of God on the world of unbelievers. And then he added this, Jesus said, When these things begin to come to pass, then lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts are overcharged with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life so that that day come upon you unexpectedly. For as a snare it shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch you therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Let me stop there. I was going to share with you, and I may share this next week. This is the reality of the world we're living in. This is what you can look to in the world, not in Christ, but in the world, in 2024. China has revealed its intentions for taking over Taiwan, even though it's never governed it. China is making nuclear weapons faster than ever thought possible. There are concerns about the potential nuclear assault by North Korea. The dictator there, Kim Jong-un, 
has created and tested various ballistic missiles capable of reaching targets in Japan and the U.S. mainland. Number three, the, Is the Israel-Hamas war began in October 2023, shows no signs of ending anytime soon. Israel officials have warned of a prolonged conflict that might extend through 2024 and beyond. President, Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu's goal of completely wiping out Hamas is considered by many analysts as nearly impossible. The influence of Hamas extends beyond Gaza in the year 2024. The war will probably become far more intense, leading to numerous casualties on both sides. Then you've got number four, you've got Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Some are predicting great famine in 2024 and that these wars will result in severe economic and geopolitical consequences and that the world will be plunged into chaos and conflict with the lives of millions at stake. Seven Iran-backed militias and attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria may escalate the war. It will escalate it and may expand it into World War III. 2024, you'll probably see the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church replaced, either by death or because of his health. There's no question that the days of the earth prior to the second coming of Christ will be marked by pestilence, famine, conflict, confusion, and unbelief. And that doesn't seem, in my mind, to be any other reasonable explanation for those events now occurring throughout planet Earth. I would prepare myself this morning when I was up early and uh, turned on my laptop to send these fellows some notes out here. You know what I saw, first thing I saw? Advertisement for gas mask. The selling gas mask in the United States. Gas mask. Because if we have the kind of warfare that could happen here, you're going to need one. You're going to need something. The greatest protection you can have is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if we have him, we can't lose. <laughs> the Lord says, Paul says, if I leave here, I'm going to be with him. If I stay here, then he's going to bless me and use me for his glory and for his honor. Either way, I'm going to be a winner. Please, if you have never come to Christ, come to him now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Let's stand together. Thank you for your attention and your time. Father, we pray now that you'll bless your word and you'll stir up our spirits. That we might seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he's near. That all who are in the sound of my voice, whether here in this auditorium or whether watching by the internet. Who are not certain of their salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they will call upon him now. They will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that they might be saved. Father, we know that time is coming when this old world will be plunged into chaos. What in the world will we do then if we do not have Christ as our hope and as our salvation? Oh, have mercy upon us and send a revival, send an awakening. Have mercy upon the United States, I pray, Lord. Convert people who are now standing against you and against your people, against everything that you stand for. They are celebrating everything that you say will hurt us and damn us. That's what they're for. And they're selling their goods to multitudes. Oh, Lord, we pray, have mercy upon us. Now I ask also that you'll bless our fellowship together in the fellowship hall. We thank you for the food that has been brought. We ask you to nourish and strengthen our bodies and strengthen us and use us for your honor, for your glory.
We give you the praise for all of our blessings. In Jesus' name.